This is the Scripture Driven Church Broadcast, brought to you by Teaching the Word Ministries. The Church of Jesus Christ must be the Scripture Driven Church, relying on God's inspired and inerrant Word as our sole authority and our infallible critic in every area of life and ministry. And now, here's author, Bible teacher, and Teaching the Word president, Dr. Paul Elliott, to introduce today's program. Did you know that if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, that God has given you the gift of adoption as a son? This is a precious teaching in the Word of God, but today it is very little taught in our churches and very little understood by the people of God. I hope you'll join us today as we explore this great gift of God, the gift of adoption, which is the sure possession of every believer in Christ. Heavenly Father, Your Word tells us that You have given Your people the privilege of calling You our Father, because You have given us this precious gift of adoption as sons. I pray that as we explore this great truth in Your Word today, that Your Holy Spirit will illuminate it, for every believer who is listening. And Father, if there is anyone listening to this message who has not received the great gift of adoption in Christ, I pray that this will be the day and the hour in which your Holy Spirit will bring that person to saving faith. I pray all of this in the name of our great Savior, your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, let me call your attention once again to the passage on which we are focusing in this series of messages, which is found in the book of Colossians, in chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. If you're able to do so, I hope that you will turn there with me in your own copy of God's Word. It is the Word of God that is central. Anything and everything that this preacher or any other preacher has to say must be tested against the Word of God and proved by the Word of God. It is no insult to any true preacher of the Word for his hearers to test what he says, to make sure that it is, in fact, what Scripture says. So please turn with me, if you are able, to Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and let us hear the Word of God. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, we also will appear with him in glory. As I've said many times during the course of this series, the words that we have just read are an imperative. They are a command of God. What we have before us is not optional for the Christian, it is essential. If indeed we are Christians, if indeed we have been raised with Christ, we must focus our attention on things above, where Christ is, rather than on the things of this earth, which is under God's curse, and is passing away, and will eventually be destroyed." We've seen this imperative not only in Colossians, but also in many other places in the Word of God. During this part of our series, we are focusing our attention on this theme of heavenly mindedness as we find it in Paul's epistles to the various churches of the New Testament period. And at the present time, we are focusing our attention especially on one of the most vital reasons why we must set our minds on things above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And that reason is the very great fact that every one of us who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ have been given adoption as sons. In our last message, we saw that the picture that we have before us in Scripture is this, that each of us, each believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, male or female, man or woman, boy or girl, has been given the position and the status of an adopted son in the eyes of God. The picture that we have before us in Paul's epistles is based on the Roman law of adoption that would have been familiar to Paul's readers in that day. The Roman law of adoption 
was different for an adopted son than it was for an adopted daughter. The rights and the position that were granted to an adopted daughter under Roman law were not the same, not nearly as extensive as the rights and privileges that were granted to an adopted son. To be adopted as a son under Roman law meant that you had the right to the name and the citizenship of the person who adopted you. You had the right to inherit your adopted father's property. The adopted son had the same rights and privileges and position as a naturally born son. These were rights that were not granted to an adopted daughter. The Roman law of adoption also granted the one who adopted that son the full rights and responsibilities of a natural father, full authority over the adopted son, and full responsibility to care for the adopted son. That is the picture that we have before us. Each and every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, regenerated and indwelled by the Holy Spirit, has received the adoption of sons. We read of this great truth in several places in Paul's epistles, and I would ask you to turn to them with me if you are able as I read them. First of all, please turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, notice verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons, by Jesus Christ, to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Notice that in this passage we are told that it has been God's plan to redeem a people for Himself as His adopted sons from before the foundation of the world, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in coming into this world to accomplish our redemption. And then turn with me next, if you are able, to the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 14. We read these words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. And then notice what Paul has to say in the verses that follow about the things that are true because of our position as the adopted sons of God. Notice beginning at verse 18 of Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing, notice, of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty, notice again, of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, notice again, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. This is the heaven-bound orientation of the adopted sons of God. Nothing that we experience now is worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. The creation itself is yearning for the final revelation, the final consummation of the adoption of the sons of God. Turn with me also, if you are able, to the book of Galatians, chapter 4. 
We read a much larger section of this passage in our last message, but I want to focus our attention in this message on verses 4 through 7. Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, notice, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We also saw in our last message that just as we are justified by the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, we are also adopted by the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Both of these aspects of our salvation are legal transactions in the courtroom of God. The one transaction that Christ accomplished at the cross, redeeming us, buying us out of the slave market of sin, that one transaction between God the Son and God the Father has brought about both legal acts on our behalf, both justification and adoption. Not only have we been declared not guilty by God the Judge, but God the Judge has adopted us as His own sons. What a tremendous turnabout. What a tremendous change in our position. We were on our way to hell. We were without God, without hope in the world. We were lost, spiritually dead. We were totally unable to save ourselves. We were filthy with sin. We were guilty through and through. But even though we were condemned to eternal death, even though God the righteous judge had pronounced the sentence against us according to his perfect law, and even though all that waited for us was for that sentence to be carried out at the last judgment, even though all that waited for us was to be cast into hell at the last day. God's only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into the courtroom, as it were. He came to the heavenly altar with His own blood. And in one great transaction, He not only made provision for the judge who condemns us to declare us not guilty, but He also made provision for the judge who had condemned us to adopt us as his own sons. Dear friends, this is indescribable grace. This is infinite mercy. The Apostle John marvels at this in his first epistle in chapter 3, verse 1. He says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. The world does not know God, the world does not know Christ, and the world does not know us, because we are no longer of this world. And then John goes on to say this, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He, Jesus, is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in him has this hope in Jesus, purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. Behold what manner of love, John says, God who was once your condemning judge is now your loving Father. Furthermore, the Word of God declares to us that this adoption as sons of God is absolutely secure. We saw that the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 12 tells us, that God has given us the right, the authority, to become and to be called the sons of God. That is, in fact, who we are, and no one can take that from us. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, beginning at verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Dear friend, if you are a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ as you are listening to me today, then you are the adopted Son of God, and no one can take you out of God's hand. 
you are in the double grip of God the Father and God the Son, and no one, nothing, can break their hold upon you. Now let me also give you a warning. There is a false teaching in some circles today about the doctrine of adoption, and it is related to a false teaching about the doctrine of justification and a false teaching about the doctrine of water baptism. There are growing numbers of false teachers today who are saying that we are saved by being united with Christ through water baptism. And these false teachers say that we get the benefits of salvation through water baptism. And they go beyond that. They say that Jesus was justified, and so therefore we are justified. Jesus was sanctified, and so therefore we are sanctified. And furthermore, they say that Jesus was adopted, therefore we are adopted. And this false teaching goes on to say that we can lose all of these things. We can lose salvation. We can lose justification. We can lose adoption if we do not continually keep God's law. Now, dear friends, please listen to me carefully. This is false teaching. It is wrong on so many levels. First of all, we are not saved by water baptism. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by the blood of Christ. Water baptism does not save the soul. Water baptism is a witness to the fact that God has done His saving work in an individual. That is how we testify to the fact that we are saved. And furthermore, Scripture never says that Jesus was justified, so therefore we are justified. And Scripture never says that Jesus was adopted by the Father, so therefore we are adopted. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Jesus is God the Son. He is sinless. He always was. He always will be. But this false doctrine of which I am speaking takes Jesus off his throne as God the Son, and it makes him nothing more than the first Christian. This is a false Jesus. The Christ of the Bible did not need to be justified or sanctified as fallen sinners need to be. He did not need to be adopted. Scripture makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the eternal and only begotten Son of God. We are the ones who are adopted sons of God, according to Scripture. And dear friends, we cannot lose our adoption in Christ. The way these false teachers have it, it is as though God is saying, if you don't behave yourself, if you don't keep my law, I'll tear up the adoption papers and put you out on the street. I'll put you out of my family. You'll no longer be my son. But that is not what Scripture says. Scripture says that God has done what he has done, and it will never be reversed. And not only that, Scripture tells us that by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, God will cause us to walk in a way that is worthy of the name Adopted Son of God. We find even more about this great guarantee in Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to spend more time in the book of Hebrews later in this series, the Lord willing, but when we come to the book of Hebrews, our focus is going to be on the heavenly high priestly and intercessory work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also find in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2 more about this great truth of our adoption as sons of God. Turn with me, if you are able, to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, notice, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, that is, to bring him to the end goal of accomplishing their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason, notice, he, the Lord Jesus, is not ashamed to call them, is not ashamed to call us, dear friends, brethren, 
saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, notice, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Dear friends, this is the picture of the consummation of our adoption through Christ. The Lord Jesus, the captain of our salvation, is bringing many sons to glory. We who are in Christ are those sons, adopted sons of the living God, with all the rights and privileges of adopted sons. The writer to the Hebrews says that both he who sanctifies the Lord Jesus Christ and those who are being sanctified, we who are being set apart as God's adopted sons, are all of one. And for this reason, the writer says, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. And we are told in this passage that the great day is coming when our Lord and Savior is going to present us before his Father, and he's going to say, Father, here am I and the children, the adopted brethren that you have given me. Dear friends, in view of these things, in view of this great doctrine of adoption, in view of the fact that we who have been raised with Christ are the adopted sons of God, how can you do anything less than to seek those things which are above, where Christ is, the one who has accomplished your adoption, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, your Father. How can you do anything less than to set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth? You died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You died to this world. You're no longer a son of this world. You are the adopted son of God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And you have the great promise that when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And he will say to the Father on that great day, Father, here am I and the children, the adopted brethren that you have given me. And you will stand there with Christ, glorified forever. Dear friends, there's much more for us to see about this great doctrine of adoption, tremendous truth. And so I hope you'll join us again as we continue our consideration of this great truth of God on our next program. Here once again is Dr. Paul Elliott with some closing comments. Friends, we're offering a very special free book during this series of messages. And if you've not yet requested your free copy, I hope you'll do so today. The title of the book is Setting Our Affections Upon Glory by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. This book contains a collection of powerful messages that will challenge and encourage you to think and to live with the values of heaven at the forefront of your mind. We're offering this great resource at no cost or obligation, free and postage paid to anyone who requests it anywhere in the world while supplies last. If you haven't yet requested your free copy of Setting Our Affections Upon Glory, here's how you can contact us. If you're listening in North America, you can call us toll-free anytime, 24 hours a day at 888-804-9655. Once again, our toll-free number for listeners in North America is 888-804-9655. If you hear a recorded message when you call, please leave a voicemail message letting us know that you would like to receive the book and we'll return your call as soon as possible. And once again, there's no cost or obligation. You can also request your free copy online at our website, teachingtheword.org. Just click the contact link on our homepage and let us know you'd like to receive the book. Once again, that's the contact link on our website, teachingtheword.org. Or you can write to us at Teaching the Word Ministries, Box 2533, Westminster, Maryland, 21158, USA. Once again, our mailing address is Teaching the Word Ministries, Box 2533, Westminster, Maryland, 21158, USA. I hope you'll join us next time as once again we focus our attention on the new privileges, relationships, and responsibilities that are ours as the adopted sons of our Heavenly Father. Until next time, may God richly bless your personal study of His inspired, infallible, inerrant Word.
This weekly program, The Scripture Driven Church, is brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Teaching the Word Ministries. 